Welcome to this KSAT 12 News special, Vote 2016. Think about it. Right now, as we are taping this, we are less than two weeks away from early voting, less than a month away from Election Day. And one of the important decisions that will be in front of Bear County voters, <coughs> who will be the next sheriff of Bear County? Four years ago, the county elected its first ever female sheriff. It is the 11th largest department in the United States when it comes to county deputies and county law enforcement. Think about that as you head into the booth in November. We have asked the two leading candidates to join us here in the KSAD 12 studios. Will allow me to introduce Sheriff Susan Pomerlo and SAPD Sergeant Javier Salazar. Thank you both for joining us this Thank afternoon on this live stream and what will be on KSAT.com. Uh, just for ground rules here, I know we've kind of gone over it, but for the people at home, first off, thank you for taking part in this debate. Thank you at home for watching this debate and what is one of the most important races that we have in front of us. I am the moderator. This is a debate slash forum, not really time limits, but I am going to kind of hurry this thing along so we can get to as many issues as possible. I don't want to be rude. I don't want to interrupt, but I will if I feel it's necessary. Understood, Steve. Thank you. Uh, Thank you both for being here. Absolutely. All right, I want to start with you, Sheriff. Um, talk about what <clears throat> gives you a unique advantage over your opponent when it comes to being Sheriff of Bear County. My experience as an Air Force Major General, a senior executive at USAA, prepared me to lead large organizations and manage big budgets. And that's what the Bear County Sheriff's Office is about it's a law enforcement agency but we have to run it efficiently and be good stewards of taxpayer dollars and you don't just get those kinds of experiences to lead an organization of almost 2,000 people and manage budgets of almost 200 million dollars that's a different set of skills than being in operations law enforcement operations and so those are the kinds of skills and experiences and successes that i've had in my years in the work uh, workplace sergeant salazar yes sir. What, what sets you apart from sheriff pomelo well as a bear county native i certainly understand the culture of bear county and as a 23-year veteran of law enforcement with the largest law enforcement agency in the county, I understand the law enforcement culture that, that exists. Uh, I've, I've been blessed in that I've had a, a very well-rounded career. Started out as a boots on the ground patrol officer, working my way up, working through community policing, uh, spending, spending 10 years in covert operations, uh, working as an internal affairs investigator, a spokesperson, um, and, and also most recently as the, I, I run the public integrity unit for the department. And so it's given me a, a well-rounded bird's eye view of, of law enforcement in general, in particular here in, in, in the Bear County area. I know the, the, the wants, the needs, and the, uh, the requirements uh, of, of deputies that, are, that make up this, this organization of, uh, that is the Bear County Sheriff's Office. But you, but you, I put <clears throat> the perceived weaknesses for, for both of you. Uh, you know, when it comes to, to the sheriff, you'd been in charge of a large number of people, but you had no law enforcement experience per se four years ago. Mm -hmm. Javier, you have the law enforcement experience, but you've never been in charge of a large number of people. How do you answer that perceived weakness? The, the positions that I've held have transcended rank. And so when you're talking about uh, the, the traditional uh, span of control of a sergeant on, on, a, on a police department, you're talking about 10 to 20 people uh, under that person's uh, purview. The positions that I've held within the police department have been more bird's eye, more global in nature. So when I, when I say that I run the public integrity unit for the department, uh, I've got several detectives that work under me, but I'm responsible for the public integrity of the entire police agency, 2,300 officers. Uh, when I say that I was the spokesman for the department, I controlled messaging and, and media and, and communications for the entire organization. So my responsibilities, my positions that I've held have really transcended rank. But it's a little different in that role than you know, a, a sheriff that's in charge of not only the deputies, but also the jail and also courthouse security and things like that. Would you at least concede that? I won't. There's, there's a lot of moving parts to it, but it's something that it, I've been, I've spent 23 years preparing for this. And so I, 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 I wouldn't concede that point. I'm, I'm fully prepared for it. It's something that I've done, you know, the, the latter part of my career as a member of the administration of what is the largest law enforcement agency in the county. Sheriff, talk about 
the perceived weakness of you four years ago, and I think <coughs> still in some ranks, is that you don't have a law enforcement background. You have four years under your belt, yeah. but you don't have a law enforcement background per se. Mm -hmm. You know, I would compare this, well, first off, by law, a sheriff in a county of this size has 10 appointed positions. I have senior leaders from law enforcement, jail operations, and resource management, in particular the law enforcement and jail operations, who have over 200 years of senior law enforcement leadership. And in fact, the chief deputy served 34 years in the San Antonio Police Department and retired as the number two in command, the assistant chief, Manuel Longoria. And the same goes across the board for individuals that are serving in senior, senior leadership positions. But when you talk about, you know, the sheriff's office, we have three major responsibilities as is determined by Texas law. First, we serve the courts, bailiffs, and all of those functions that serve the courts. Mental health, not just doing crisis response, but serving all of the precepts of the probate court when it comes to mental health warrants. Those are not the kind of that's not the kind of role that is involved in a police department. We also maintain the jail. And with the jail, people in detention or in the corrections profession have some, they do some things that are related to law enforcement, but their role is in keeping safe those in custody but there are, there's a different role and different functions that they perform. And my opponent has never been in either one of those two. And then the thing that is similar is the law enforcement piece for the unincorporated areas of the county, but across the county because we have jurisdiction over all of it. All right, Sergeant Salazar, I want to give you a chance to answer those charges. Sure. Well, the, the sheriff uh, quite frequently refers back to her military service as a general. And, and while that's certainly honorable, let's not forget that, that one of the largest, uh, and I won't call it a sex scandal, one of the largest rape scandals to have ever rocked the Air Force happened under her watch. Uh, 40, a total of 47 uh, basic trainees were raped by a total of about 22 uh, drill instructors that, were, that answered to, to the sheriff. And so that, that happened under her purview. Uh, it continues onto the, in, into the, her role as the sheriff, as it, to me it demonstrates the, the inability to be in touch with, with what's going on under your command. Here recently, I pointed out some, some shortcomings in the, in the current administration, and I, I brought to light some issues that the sheriff seemed to be unaware of, that, that there are, are detention officers, due to the manpower issues and morale issues in the jail, are being forced to use bathrooms side by side with, in, side by side with inmates, and female deputies, in fact, are, are, are becoming physically ill from having to not go to the bathroom for upwards of 8 to 16 hours sometimes. And the sheriff herself uh, started calling that garbage and drivel. And, and to me, that's just the dismissive attitude and the lack of connectivity to her people that has, that has just carried over from her days in the Air Force. Do you have proof of this? Yes. I've, heard, I've heard the urinary tract infection yes. you said that one of the female jailers got because yes. she wasn't allowed to go to the bathroom. Yes. You have names and times and proof. I won't share those with you because this, this sheriff has demonstrated her willingness to, to intimidate those deputies. In fact, at this same forum, she made it a point to intimidate every, every deputy in the room. And so I would not expose these, these uh, officers to that. But that doesn't seem fair. Well. If you're making these charges, but you're not putting a name <laughs> with it, 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 it doesn't seem well, Steve, like you're, you're giving the sheriff well, Steve, you're, you're, in the, you're in the media, and, yeah. I, and I think that you guys are, are able to protect your sources. And I worked 10 years in covert operations, and there is a, a specific examples where you need to protect your sources. And in this instance, I'm protecting my sources. All right, Sheriff Pomerlo, a lot in there for oh, you yes. to answer when well, it comes to when it. And certainly, we're, we're going to talk about the jail and some of those things coming up. But I, I want to give you a chance to respond, just like I gave the sergeant a chance to respond. Well, let me correct the record. I retired in 2000 from the Air Force. The sexual assault scandal at Lackland didn't happen until mid-2000s. So uh, Mr. Salazar doesn't even know what he's talking about. And in fact, 
the reason that uh, that that scandal happened uh, after all the after action reports was that over a period of time since 9-11 and since we were at war for uh, the last 14 years is that out of basic training they removed three levels of supervision because they were needed other places in the Air Force and in fact that issue was part of why uh, we had already identified the span of control issues in the jail because at one time we had at any one time one lieutenant over 3,000 inmates or one sergeant over 928 inmates and so as a result of that we worked with commissioners court and were able to add um, uh, and <coughs> we're in a phase in for nine additional uh, lieutenants and a similar number of additional sergeants to address the span of control issue, but I retired uh, a number of years prior to that happening. How do you answer the charges one. about jailers? Okay. How do you answer the charges about jailers? And I'll, let me uh, excuse me here. Just, yeah. How do you yeah. answer the charges about the jailers specifically that they're overworked, they're underpaid, that uh, overtime may have been accomplished <clears throat> by cutting corners and that they're not allowed to use their own bathrooms they have to yeah. go side by side and the urinary tract because yeah. they're working so much overtime well to that particular allegation uh, in fact when mr salazar first brought this up uh, at another forum earlier in that afternoon in fact your <clears throat> station had called us to validate whether or not that was true and talked about a woman uh, deputy who also uh, had to work a double shift, didn't have uh, child care, and had to bring her daughter into the jail while she worked. But Mr. Salazar didn't do his homework because that happened in May of 2012. And I have the, um, the articles from um, the, the news that says that happened in May of 2012, long before I retired. So let me comment on the child, the child care. Yes. Issue. Well, the she didn't do her homework because I didn't bring up that issue. She brought it up at that forum. That was the first I'd ever heard of a, of a female deputy bringing a child to work was when if, she brought it if up. If you take a look at the tape, you'll find out that that is not true. All right. But, yeah. but, talk, anyway. about, but talk about the charges of the bathrooms, yes. yeah. specifically what he's talking about right now, that there that there's <clears> females that that are going to the bathroom side by side with inmates is that your well, no male officers male officers have that luxury of, of being able to go into the bathroom and, and use the bathroom side by side with inmates female officers are not being they don't have that luxury so they're becoming physically ill as a result of it how do you what do you, uh, how do you answer that? well in fact the day after that forum there were uh, a high number of women who called and were incensed that Mr. Salazar would make that kind of an allegation because it just isn't true. And uh, if somebody needs to go to the bathroom, there are other people there. They're not alone uh, in, they may be alone in a housing unit, but there are numerous <clears throat> people in the corridors uh, and in supervisory positions uh, so that they can take a break and they do take breaks. So that's just a preposterous uh, allegation. Let's talk more about the jail though. Yes. Four years ago mm -hmm. you made it a major issue. You had uh, a number of people standing behind you where you said you were going to take care of some of the jail problems. Give me specifically what you have changed at the jail since taking office. Okay. When I came, uh, when I became the sheriff, uh, they were doing 16,000 hours of mandatory overtime. And you have to go back a little bit. In the 2011-2012 timeframe, the county commissioners cut 100 positions from the jail. And so over a period of time, that drove up overtime because their view was that that is a more efficient way of handling overtime and peaks of, uh, of workload. That didn't work out, but they also uh, so we identified critical and non-critical positions. Uh, they were even doing overtime for civilian <coughs> employees. We also were able to get an additional 50 detention officers in that first year and uh, add those. And uh, since that time, uh, in earlier this year, 
we had reduced overtime by 90%. In the first two months of this year, it was down to 1,600 hours per month. And those are facts, not allegations. In addition to that, um, we know that during the summer, there are, um, there's a rise in population. And so we know that there is going to be overtime. And today, uh, during those peak times, we are paying uh, cash, not compensatory time, but cash for overtime at time and a half pay. We also make sure that they are scheduled so that they're not working more overtime, which would uh, make it unsafe for them. And uh, on average, uh, an individual works one overtime shift per week. And as I look at the overtime requirements every single day, around 40% of all of the mandatory overtime requirements are being worked by civilians, uh, excuse me, by, uh, by volunteers. Are you happy with the situation at the jail as it stands today? No, I think we can still, uh, we need some additional manpower. And um, that's why I work closely with the commissioner's court uh, because they approve our budget, but I have to present that based on what our requirements are. Commissioner, Sergeant, do you think the jail's in a better place today than it was four years ago? Absolutely not. I think that the story that, that KSAT brought to light, and thank you for bringing that to light a few weeks ago when you interviewed those two deputies, who, by the way, had to be interviewed with their faces covered and their voices distorted. Uh, Y'all, br you brought to light a whole bunch of issues at the jail. You know, so we're, I'm sure we're going to be talking about suicides at, at, at length here in just a little bit. Uh, the, the 20 deaths that have occurred under the current administration is, is, is plenty of proof that, that nothing has improved there at the jail. But in particular, this latest story brought to light many issues, one of which is that these officers are, they feel like there is no recourse other than to take shortcuts, and those shortcuts are leading to deaths. Those deaths are inevitably going to lead to wrongful death lawsuits, sometimes upwards of a million dollars. And it's something that's, that's an irresponsible use of taxpayer dollars. So when the sheriff talks about being a good steward of taxpayer dollars, wrongful death lawsuits are not the way to go. You, your answer to that, Sheriff. Mr. Salazar has never even worked in the jail and has no idea how, what the requirements are, the kind of um, custody requirements there are. And that's why when there were the problems in the jail before, I did a nationwide search to hire a professional jail administrator. And Deputy Chief Raul Benasco one, he's been in the corrections business for over 30 years. Not only did he work in the Department of Corrections in the prison system for 20 years, he's also led mega jails uh, for over 10 years. He's also in his second term as on the Board of Governors for the American Correctional Association and is nationally known for his expertise, his talent, and his ability to run very large uh, corrections facilities. So, so is it correct to say you feel the jail is moving in the right direction, though? You does. feel like it's better than it was four years ago. Absolutely. I did not ask you that question. I want to make sure yeah, I, I absolutely. do. And you know, um, it's a work in progress. I mean, uh, this is a 28-year-old facility. And we are, we have, we're already underway for a $42 million capital project, which will make, um, I mean, it won't look like the same place uh, two years from now as we um, repurpose some space in some areas of the jail, as we um, renovate um, part of the annex, and as we build uh, another facility for housing up to 512 inmates. I also want to make sure that I get you to answer the charges, the serious charges that Sergeant Salazar just leveled, mm -hmm. that basically cutting over time is leading to loss of life in the jail. I'm not mischaracterizing that, am I? No, I'm, I'm the, the officers cutting corners by their own admission on, on doing their checks is, is what's, what's bringing about these, these deaths. How do, you, how do you answer that? If someone is cutting corners by their own admission, I'm wondering why they're not doing the job that they've been trained to do. 
and why if there are issues there that they're not raising that issue so if there are things that we can do to correct that that we do and let me uh, uh, let me comment here part of changing uh, this organization from one that was 30 years behind that's in workforce development it's in facilities uh, it's in technology and we know early on from a, a technology standpoint everybody had to use uh, handwritten logs to log in observation checks and we know that those were falsified in fact um, uh, about uh, six months prior to my taking office uh, there was a death in the jail and uh, the individual was uh, charged and then terminated from employment because of uh, falsifying those records. When you talk about suicides in the jail and you talk about a work in progress, mm -hmm. is that one of the things you're talking about? Uh, it certainly is because it's always a work in progress because of the population that we deal with. And let me tell you a little bit about, talk about suicides. When I became the sheriff, a report that had been done um, several years prior because of a spike in suicides, none of the recommendations had been implemented. And so we got funding and we implemented all of those recommendations, which went everywhere from replacing the types of beds uh, that could be used as anchor points for someone to take their own life, uh, to uh, less uh, to suicide beds um, so that there aren't any of those kinds of um, anchor points. We replaced uh, lighting. We replaced the grid, the air vent grid, so that it prevented someone from using those to hurt themselves. Um, so a tremendous amount of changes there. Uh, additional training. We provide 50% more training to our deputies on crisis intervention and recognizing um, issues that may, where someone has yeah. lost hope um, uh, from a mental health perspective. I mentioned off the top that this is being live streamed on KSAT.com. We're also on Facebook, on KSAT's Facebook page, and on Facebook Live. So we've got some questions coming okay. in. Right. And one of them is for you. Okay. But at, do, well, and yet, in spite of this nationwide search and this, this deputy chief's 30 years of, uh, of experience with mega jails, which to me sounds like we're headed toward privatization, but that's a whole other subject, uh, that deputy chief and his staff still couldn't tell us what was going on with those, with, that these detention officers came and told you firsthand, we're taking shortcuts, we're using the technology to circumvent the system. Yeah. Because of all of those changes, <clears throat> we've reduced suicides in the jail from the previous four years by almost 30 percent and we continue working to make sure that we make the kinds of changes that we uh, provide additional training uh, and enhance what we do in terms of identifying individuals that may be at risk. Now, we've been hearing a lot from you on your solutions to this mm -hmm. whole thing. I want to point out that uh, Eddie Garza on our, one of our Facebook page mm -hmm. has a question for you he okay. says what ideas or plans do you have for jail employees well we need to make sure as far as as far as reducing these suicides um, I disagree that they've brought it down by 30 percent you guys did a side-by-side -side comparison not too long ago between this administration and the administration prior and the numbers looked pretty similar to me I don't I didn't see it I didn't see a 30 percent drop um, and so I would see I we need to get back to basics as far as this goes uh, we need to get more proactive as of now, I've heard the sheriff talk a whole lot about uh, four questions that are asked at the booking process, you know, about somebody's propensity toward, toward suicidal behavior. Uh, we need to see some more, get, get more proactive as far as that goes. So the way we see mental health officers deployed in the field on the law enforcement side and with the San Antonio Police Department, we need to be doing a better job of getting proactive and, and deploying specially trained detention officers that are, that are trained in mental health into the jail environment to constantly monitor that inmate population for signs of, of uh, mental crisis. And the reason being is those four questions are great at booking, but what that's not taking into consideration is that at booking people may be too proud to say that they've got any problems, or maybe everything's just fine in this person's life. But six months into their stay, 
they maybe their their wife has now told them I'm not waiting for you. I've found somebody else and I'm, and I'm I'm going I'm leaving you. You won't be seeing me or the kids again. Well now that person's in trouble. His mental the wheels are coming off of his life and he's in mental health crisis. And the last time anybody inquired about his mental health was 6 months ago when he was booked. That's that's insufficient. To me we need to be doing more. But we also need to be holding the the officers accountable, giving them the tools for success. I mean they're for the most part, give me, give me specifics. Well, we need to have the right policies and procedures in place to make sure that they're not taking shortcuts, as they, again, by their own admission, have told you guys that they're doing. How do you do that? You you do a better job of monitoring the situation. You have enough. First off, we need to get that that manpower turned around to where there's enough manpower to even take a bathroom break. But we need to make sure that that their supervisors that are holding their the officers' feet to the fire and making sure that they're doing their checks the correct way. I can give you an example. The deputies have reported to me that there's a window on the, on the doors of those, of those jail cells. That when, it, when they're making their rounds in the middle of the night, the correct way to do the checks is to physically shine your light into these, the, the cells, to physically see for signs of life, breathing, movement on, on a sleeping prisoner, and before you move on to the next cell. Well, because they're hamstrung, they've got so many restrictions in place, and the manpower is such that, that their relief was late getting there, and so they're already late, they're already behind the clock. Um, they're not physically able to check, and I'm told that about 60% of those cells have paper covering because the, the prisoners themselves are covering the cells. The only correct way to then check that cell is to get a cover officer to come to your assistance, open the door, physically look, but you can't possibly do that on 60% of the cells and still keep your, your time frames so that when the state comes and does a, another check on the next suicide, everything comes out peachy keen and everything's okay. You passed with flying colors. Okay. Let's talk about another internet question that I have here. This is from Scott Kaiser. He wants to talk about visitation at the mm -hmm. jail. Why was it so important to build a new visiting area when the old one was fine? Why was it money spent on another new substation in East or South Bear County where one is needed? Okay. That's from Scott Kaiser. Okay. Well, first off, that building was, the uh, main jail was built in 1988, and it was not built to meet the needs of what we have today, 28 years later. In addition to that, uh, people stood in line to have a 20-minute visit for anywhere from four, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 hours at a time. And so, because inmates had to be escorted to the visitation area, one, it took time uh, away from deputies uh, doing custody uh, responsibility. But whenever there was an emergency, medical or an assault or those kinds of things, the whole jail goes on lockdown. And so you may have been ready for that next visit, but it just got delayed for another hour and a half. What about people so, who say it's a little impersonal, though, the video visitation? You know, that it. it, it you know, well, should I would inmates say, be given yeah. through a window type Well, for instance, it's not a contact visit. You can't right. touch the other person. It's through a very thick piece of glass. And in fact, we've now been uh, up and running for the last two months. And we've uh, transitioned all of the uh, main jail. We've already had over 6,000 visits by video. And there have been, and it's been a tremendously positive experience for people. Not only those who never had an opportunity to see their loved one because they were in restrictive housing, because they were in the medical clinic, because they were in a mental health unit. And those are individuals today that we have the capability for them to visit. And we've had lots of people come in and say, I'm not gonna like this, or uh, this is not the same as it was, who go away saying, this is so much better. And that's the kind of feedback that we have gotten. And um, there was no way that we could even provide the required number of visits by the Texas Commission on Jail Standards if everyone had wanted their visits. Yeah. Today, we can do this, and uh, we're up now to um, about 1,400, 1,500 visits a week. 
what do you yes. say about the video visitation? It's a, it's a luxury item that <laughs> I think that there's so many other ways that that money could have been spent. Reinvested in your personnel so they're not leaving in droves. So the 189 that left since last January, maybe wouldn't have left had we reinvested that money in personnel. It's a, it's a big ticket luxury item that we still don't know the true cost of. Uh, the other day, the Rivard Report did, a, did a, an article where there was, there's going to be a projected $685,000 overage that was miscalculated. In spite of, this, of the sheriff's business acumen, there was a miscalculation. And in, in my understanding, is, is she was quoted as saying there were some incorrect assumptions made. Well, how many more incorrect assumptions are going to be made, and how much more is it going to cost the taxpayers? Your answer to that charge, Sheriff? And when the, uh, when the video visitation center was originally thought of, that was prior to me being the sheriff and the assumptions that were made by commissioner's court and the county manager were that it would save manpower it didn't and we knew it wouldn't because the manpower uh, requirements um, did not recognize what uh, what was needed in so you're the saying those already. assumptions were made by the county commissioners not your office that's correct and yet we still took it on not knowing wh whoever made those incorrect assumptions we still took on this this project that by the way other counties that have implemented it did away with it so why are we taking something like that on that other counties well, have done well, away with? mr salazar doesn't know what he's talking about <laughs> in fact this is technology that is over 20 years old it's uh uh, video visitation has been used across the nation in a variety of states and it's not new to Texas. Um, Lubbock County has had video visitation in their jail for close to 15 years um, and for us uh, and it wasn't just video visitation that was built. Bear County made a decision to have a re-entry center that helps individuals transition from being in jail to being in the community and so all of that together was what made up that cost and the um, um, director of facilities for the county manager oversee the construction uh, contracts uh, with uh, construction and that type of thing all right let's shift gears okay if that's okay let's talk sure. about body cameras Bear County yeah. is in the process of implementing body cameras. There have been some bumps. Slowly, yes. I think we can say along the way. And it's not come as fast as some county commissioners would like it to happen. Your view on the body camera issue as it comes to the county, and you have some expertise in that since you're with the city that has body cameras. I, I, helped, implement, I helped implement the system that SAPD has. And you know, I, here recently I saw a, a news story, and I think it was with y'all, where the lieutenant that was in charge of that pro project said, quite frankly, there's, there's been a lot of mistakes in, in implementation. Had we done a little more homework on the, on, the, on the front end of this and done a little bit more of a thorough evaluation of the equipment before implementing it, uh, you know, I think that there'd be less mistakes being made and those cameras would already be implemented. Uh, as we've mentioned, those, those, those uh, county commissioners have, have held, tried to hold the sheriff's feet to the fire saying it's, it's too slow. At least one congressman that I know of has also complained about the fact that it's too slow. It's, it is. Every day that our officers are hitting the streets without a body camera is another day that we're exposing the taxpayers to uh, liability that's unnecessary. Your answer to that, Sheriff. Yes. It, it, you, I mean, your lieutenant did say there have been bumps along the way. It's a mm -hmm. learning process. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, I want you to talk a yeah. little bit about it. Well, we made a decision to go with a generation two camera system. And I emphasize system. Many agencies across the country, including uh, locally, chose to go with a Generation 1 camera. What that means is that's a clip-on camera that has to be turned on and off. There are some, um, some simple things, like when you open the door, it automatically turns on the camera. But generally, it's manual. And when individuals come back, then they have to um, insert that into, it's a download the data and then index the data. That's a generation one camera. And so when that camera is obsolete and another one comes along, you have to replace the camera. Let me talk to you about generation two, what we chose. One, it's like, it's the difference between a flip phone and um, a smartphone. It's actually a computer. 
the camera. And so when we need to upgrade it, it's a matter of a software update. In addition to that, not only does that deputy have a body camera, they also have in their vehicle a dash camera, forward facing and rear facing. And in fact, the other day I was with uh, one of our motor officers and on our motorcycles, they also have body camera, a front facing and rear facing camera. And in demonstrating that, uh, he had it on and what he was able to show, we have three views that are synced up and you see behind the full view and then the deputy's uh, camera. So it's a synchronized system that is interfaced. In addition, for our cameras, um, the, uh, the technology that we have is that every 60 seconds, that video is uploaded to the cloud. How far away are we from getting this implemented? Well, in fact, Monday, we are rolling out an additional 50 cameras. How many are on the street right now? Uh, we have eight now that are on our motors. But the reason that we are taking our time, and there was one commissioner who was... Uh, commissioner uh, Calvert. Yes, yes, that was concerned. And since Absolutely. we've uh, discussed that with him and uh, uh, briefed him on more of uh, the system that we're going into and how much better technology and capability that there is uh, I know that Judge Wolf and all the rest of the commissioners are very satisfied and understand why we've done that. It does, it, it, to me, as a layman, not a lawman, I'm going to use yeah. that, that, why not work with the police department and use the same system? May I? Yeah. Okay, well, while, while the, the sheriff's Generation 2 system sits on a shelf, the other agencies They're that are using the shelf. Generation 1 system are, are working just fine. The, the contract that, that the SAPD has anyway, I know enough about it to be able to say that, the, that as those Generation 1 cameras are, are as, as the Generation 2s come into service, uh, they're going to be rotated out automatically. And the SAPD's uh, contract was set up in such a way that other area agencies could actually take advantage of that same deal. So you're right. They're, they're really... Well, well actually, wonder, yeah. actually, we were asked if we wanted to tie into it. But because we already had rocket modems, which are uh, this vendor's product, right. uh, in, already in our vehicles, we got a one for one, uh, dollar to dollar uh, credit for the equipment that we already had, the technology we already had. In addition to that, um, a city not far north of here uh, also tried to tie into that same contract and they chose uh, the same product, and they are now in a lawsuit because it didn't meet the requirements of the RFP. So it was not quite so easy to uh, just adopt the same technology. And we want to, we're looking <coughs> forward, not just getting it on the street. And more than 40% of all of the agencies across the United States that have adopted new body camera programs have had to either stop their implementation or slow it down to where it could improve. I also have the advantage, uh, I've served for almost two years as the co-chair of the American Bar Association's criminal justice, or the law enforcement subcommittee with the criminal justice committee, and served as co-chair of the ABA's uh, task force on law enforcement body cameras and systems. And so through that capability, one, we, we brought in people from the ACLU, from Fraternal Order of Police, major county sheriffs, um, the uh, National Sheriff's Association, major cities chiefs, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, Electronic Frontiers, uh, and uh, employee um, uh, labor groups to look at all of uh, the concerns as we implemented body cameras. And from that experience, we learned a lot and were able to apply that in what we were doing and what we were bringing forward and knew that this Generation 2 camera met the needs best for okay. Bear County. Okay. It's taking too long. It's taking too long. It's taking That's too long. long. All right.
Let's if you forward. want it bad, you get it bad. Right. And in fact, let me make one other comment. Because, you know, and you've, you've read on, you've been part of uh, uh, reporting on this as well, um, the slowdown in court cases in, in the courthouse um, because of the transmission issues that there were with uh, San Antonio being able to transmit that extensive amount of video to evidence to the district attorney's office. And as a result of that, uh, and so we're not behind on that, uh, but that took quite a while for... It's delaying justice, is it, that what you're saying? It, it has delayed quite a... And, it, and here's the other offset that nobody really thinks about, and that is... Quickly, because that, I want to move on to yeah, some more of our that questions increased, online here. That increased, that slowdown increased the population of the jail by approximately 100 to 150 um, more inmates at any one time as a result of that kind of slowdown. All right, this is a question from Chris Santel. I'll ask you first, okay. Sergeant Salazar. How is the Bear County Sheriff's Office going to combat the heroin and opioid crisis? Just like everything else, we're, go we're going to take, you know, you have to take a multifaceted approach. There's the enforcement aspect of it. And again, having worked 10 years in covert operations, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the, the heroin and opioid uh, crisis. Uh, but you have to take the, the, there's the enforcement aspect where you're out do, running undercover operations, doing, doing uh, search warrants, narcotic search warrants, large scale operations to dismantle organizations that are bringing this in from other parts of the world. But also there's a public education aspect where you're educating parents on what to look out for. You're educating schools what to look out for because as we're evolving our technology to stay ahead of the game, the dope dealers are also updating their technology to try to stay ahead of the game as they prey on our kids in, in schools and as they try to, stay, try to stay. So it's a constant struggle and we just need to, to, to stay the course and make sure that we're evolving as an agency to do it. What is Bear County doing right now to battle the opioid and heroin crisis that we're seeing across the nation? Certainly not just a San Antonio right. Bear County issue. You know, and certainly it's addressing the issue locally, but it's also addressing the issue in terms of um, different synthetic drugs, for example, um, because you can change one molecule uh, in the in a uh, um, you know in a compound, and it's no longer an illegal drug. Right. And so it also needs to take a look at legislation. In fact, uh, in the Uniform Code of Military Justice, um, the Armed Forces did some of that, where instead of looking at the uh, Schedule A drugs um, to determine the compound, uh, the scientific uh, uh, compound that it is, they've taken a look at um, the effect on the individual, uh, whether or not it's behavioral, um, those types of things to determine the effect on individuals. But this is across the board, uh, and I saw just recently where um, for opioid, um, uh, opioid, opioid um, addictions that there is a new drug uh, inserted in the skin. And, you know, this, we've got to do this from a national perspective, an international perspective, from legislation, and so this isn't just about right here locally, because if we don't control the flow coming in, if we don't um, educate people uh, to what they need to know, and parents, uh, then we're still going to be behind the power curve. And that's why it's important. Last week, I actually uh, met with several uh, border sheriffs that actually made the trip here to endorse me. Um, and the, so the fact is, I've been meeting with those sheriffs for, for several months now, to talk to them about how best we can partner to stop this stuff at the border before it even comes to Bear County. Remember, in 23 years in law enforcement, I'm a big proponent of preventing crime from ever even affecting us if we can. So I'm proposing to work with these border sheriffs to stop the flow bef long before it ever reaches Bear County, and pre we're prepared yeah. to do that. Well, it's interesting, these particular, uh, and with all due respect to my colleagues, uh, Texas sheriffs, these particular individuals, number one, are not involved in the Texas Sheriff's Association, nor are they involved in the Texas Border Coalition, which are addressing these kinds of issues with the Texas legislature and working with them on making sure uh, that we've got the right things in place all the way from Department of Public Safety 
to, uh, I mean, we're a corridor because our concern is that anything that gets past the border, it comes up I-35, 281, 37, and then it goes across I-10 and it's to the rest of the United States. All right, I got some quick things I want to get to uh, because we're running out of time here and I want to give you each a two minute closing statement here. Talk about uh, what happened earlier this week when some uh, San Antonio officers, motorcycle officers, were caught posing with candidate Donald Trump with one of his hats on. They were disciplined. How, Sheriff, would you handle that if it were some of your deputies? One, we have policies. Uh, and this is just like when I was in the military, whether it's the Hatch Act or whether or not it's a local policy, that when you are in uniform and serving this uh, community, it's inappropriate to appear at political events um, uh, with a, for, you know, advocating for a particular candidate. Yeah. Um, I saw the video and I think it was, um, uh, probably somebody was handing out caps and there was, uh, so certainly it's important to make, uh, to remind people of what their responsibilities are. We did that. They would be disciplined with, with Bear County. You know, I, I think you have to look at what, what it was and what is the level of discipline yeah. on that. Uh, it's, it's being handled appropriately. Uh, you know, Chief McManus has been doing this a long time. And, uh, you know, the officers, I think they, everybody maybe got caught up in the moment. And, you know, they, I think the officers fully realized what it was that they did and that they, that they did was, is being handled accordingly. Do you consider San Antonio a sanctuary city? And uh, the definition? To apply to some cities in the United States that have policies designed to not persecute undocumented immigrants. Is San Antonio a sanctuary city in your opinion? City Council never, never took that step of making San Antonio a sanctuary city. What we do have in place is a policy within the San Antonio Police Department that ensures that, that we put that, that relationship with the community uh, before immigration uh, enforcement. Uh, we need to be treating, if, if we're dealing with a victim of a crime, we need to be treating that person as a victim of a crime, and then their, their immigration status uh, is, is secondary to the fact that they're a victim of a crime. Sheriff, is San Antonio we, a sanctuary city? No, it's not. And it's, we arrest people based on probable cause. And when they come to the central magistrate and, it's deter and we can't determine what their citizenship is, then we report that to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. They make that determination, and they make the determination as to whether or not they should be detained. So the challenge, though, is that the, you know, there are victims of crimes, and individuals perpetrate crimes on individuals that may be here illegally. And it's important, there are federal laws that protect individuals that are victims of domestic violence, that are victims of human trafficking. We want to get the people who are perpetrating those crimes, not the victims. Because if we just let them run rampant, then what does that do in terms of the rule of law? But you don't think that's happening in San Antonio right now? You know, we, all, we need to encourage and talk to the community to make sure individuals know to report those crimes so we can protect them and so that uh, if they're victims of uh, human trafficking, domestic violence, those kinds of things, that they know that they are safe in coming to report those. Right, that they're not gonna be deported. That's right. All right, how do you view the Black Lives Matter movement? <laughs> you know, I think originally, and I've talked to um, a professor at uh, UTSA who teaches a class on this. Originally, Black Lives Matter was created to focus on the fact that black lives matter. And just as other movements have sometimes been captured, I think Black Lives Matter then got captured to say that it was only black lives matter. But we need to be inclusive with everyone, and all lives matter. Uh, of course, we've seen from a law enforcement perspective, blue lives matter, mm -hmm. but every life makes a difference. And that's what's important, is that every person is important in our community. 
it, I'm glad you called it a movement, Steve, because that's exactly what it is. It's, it's not a catchphrase. It's not a t-shirt. It's not a Facebook slogan. It's, it's a movement. And it's a movement that was created because the, the you know, members of the African American community are feeling undervalued. They're right. feeling marginalized. And we know that when a, se a segment of the population becomes marginalized like that, that's dangerous for everybody. And so black lives do indeed matter. And it's something that we can't downplay as a profession. We, need to, we certainly need to, to understand that and embrace it. Let's talk about um, some of the other issues that we're talking about in this day and age. Are you at all concerned about your presidential candidate at the top of the ticket affecting you in this election, either positively or negatively? Is that a concern of your share? Well, let me say this. This race is about public safety in Bear County. The sheriff's race. The sheriff's race. Yes. This race is about uh, performance in being the sheriff. I think what's important in this is that, you know, we have a civic duty, uh, and that is to vote. That's our right, and many countries don't have that. And I think it's our responsibility to make sure that we vote. And what I was disappointed to find is that my opponent has never voted in his entire life until last November when he was on the ballot. That doesn't say very much for one's civic duty and responsibility to our community. Are you concerned about being a Republican, Donald Trump at the top of your ticket, affecting you? You know, four years ago, I won this race on a bipartisan vote. And this race isn't about red or blue. And it's just like I've said to several organizations that may be affiliated on one side or the other. Yeah. When I became sheriff, I'm the sheriff for everyone because the oath that I took said that I would um, support, defend, and protect the Constitution and the laws of the United States and the laws of the state of Texas. I don't get to pick and choose which laws I enforce. I don't get to pick and choose uh, different people to apply those to. It's about being the sheriff for everyone. All right, I wanted to get to you quickly, Sergeant. Sure. I'll answer your, I'll answer your question directly. For, I mean, um, first, are you concerned about Hillary Clinton at the top of the Democratic ticket? I'm not. I'm not concerned at all. I, do, you I, think, I, do you think Donald Trump will have an effect on this race? I, I can't say. I mean, I, I, I got to think that he's going to to some extent. I'm going to run my race and just continue to do, the, do what I've been doing for the past 23 years, protecting and serving. What do you say about her charges that you haven't voted until just months ago? Look, my voting record... I, have, I may not have always been involved in the, in the, the political process. And, and like many people, I, for several years, became disillusioned with the political process due to political rhetoric that we see from politicians that, that make this their living running for office like this. Uh, so while I haven't always been the strongest voter, what I have been for 23 years is a good and honorable peace officer. All right. We've got a couple minutes here. Yeah. One comment. Yes. I was in the Air Force for 32 years. And for almost all of that, I was away from the state that I was registered in. And I voted absentee whether or not I was in the United States, whether I was in a local community, or whether or not I was serving overseas, because I knew it was that important and that important to exercise one's right to vote. We got a question from somebody online again before we do the closing argument, so I want to keep this kind of brief. Does 911 need to be more efficient? Oh, the process. Uh, in fact, um, you know, in uh, in about three months, the Quarry Run Regional Emergency Operations Center will open on the northwest side of the county, Bear Metro 911, and the Bear County Sheriff's Office dispatch will be the anchor tenant. And so, I mean, we've operated in a uh, uh, cramped quarters and uh, old equipment. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we're looking forward to additional capability. So, yes, it needs to be more efficient, and you're making it more efficient. Yes, okay. absolutely. Sergeant. The 911 system we have in place is, is, is good. You know, we're doing a good job, but there's always room for improvement, just like anything else. Certainly things like, like text to 911 are, are helping. 
But we're also in, in the process of trying to educate the public on the best use of 911 to not clog the system unnecessarily. All right, you get this next question. Okay. I heard it during the presidential debate. I liked it so much I decided to bring it to this debate. All right? You two have had numerous debates leading up to this election. What one thing <laughs> do you admire about your opponent? Her strength, her strength and her, and her, her character as, as, a, as a leader. The fact that she served our country honorably and rose to the, to the rank of, of general, uh, two-star general, I admire that, I certainly do. It's, it wasn't an easy feat. Sheriff, what one thing do you admire about Sergeant Salazar? I admire that he chose to be a public servant and is serving in an important role in our community in law enforcement. And I applaud him for being in law enforcement. Thank you, Sheriff. All right. See, that was nice. <laughs> I like ending on that. But we're going to give you each two minutes. You don't have to take all the time, however long it takes, but not more than two minutes with a closing statement to the voters who are watching right mm -hmm. now. Uh, just look at me, probably, because I'm not sure which camera it's actually going to be on. Uh, Sheriff, I'll let you go first. This race is about public safety in Bear County. It's about performance, not politics. It's about responsibility, not rhetoric. It's about experience, not e-blasts. It's about public safety and keeping every man, woman, and child in Bear County safe. When I became the sheriff, this agency was 30 years behind in technology, in facilities, in, work, in people programs. Just this week, we broke ground, after the county talked about it for over 20 years, we broke ground for the first ever substation, permanent purpose-built substation in Bear County. And one week from today, we will break ground on the second one. We're also undertaking a major capital uh, project uh, in the jail uh, complex uh, that will also improve safety, improve efficiency. And across the board, I believe we've brought facilities, we've added over 100 deputies uh, to this organization to better serve this community, but also bringing technology. We're still using DOS-based systems and lots of paper. And we are, we are in not just planning, but implementing and bringing about these changes to bring the Bear County Sheriff's Office into the 21st century. It's about experience. It's about, and I bring that experience of being a major general, of being a senior executive at USAA, and I use that experience, one, to lead strategically this organization and make sure that we're prepared not just for today, but for the future. And Time. I look forward to being your sheriff for the next four years. Time's up. Sergeant? When you call 911, nobody ever asks for a Democrat or a Republican to come to the House. What they want is the most qualified, best trained, best equipped, and most willing police officer who wants to come to their house and help them out in their time of need. Quite possibly the worst day of their life. On January 1st, 2017, I'm gonna get up for work and I'm going to put on a uniform and a badge and I'm gonna protect and serve as I've done for the past 23 years. You, the voters of Bear County, are going to decide which badge I put on that day. Whether it be the badge of a, of a San Antonio Police Department, which I've worn for that whole time, or the badge of the Bear County Sheriff. On election day, you'll be asked to make decisions at all levels of government. As to the Bear County Sheriff's Office, you'll be asked to decide who among us candidates is the most likely to fight crime effectively. Who's most likely to, fill, to form relationships with the community and who's most likely to be a good steward of taxpayer dollars? I can tell you that candidate is me. My name's Javier Salazar. I wanna be your sheriff and I'm respectfully asking for your vote. I want to thank both Sheriff Susan Palmer Lowe and Sergeant Javier Salazar for taking part in this debate. I think it's very important to have an open forum where we can express our issues and our differences. Sure. And I mostly want to thank you for doing so in a respectful manner. Yes.
something that's sometimes missing in our political <laughs> process. So I want to thank you both for being here. I also want to thank uh, the voters that are out there, the viewers that are out there. And I think I speak for these two candidates and for all the candidates that are on the ballot. The most important decision that you can make when you step into that process is just to vote. Just vote. Please vote, whether it's early voting that starts here in less than two weeks or on Election Day. I'm Steve Spreester for KSAT 12 News. Thank you for joining us for this special event. Have a great day.